The prosecutor in the Moscow, Idaho quadruple murder says he meant something else when he used the word targeted. The uh, Delphi homicide affidavit is released. One word to describe it, weak. Has Alec Murdoch been f offered a plea agreement to resolve all of his cases? Can you believe this? Ghislaine Maxwell is being manipulated? Can you imagine such a thing? Uh, San Francisco says, bring on the robots. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day. My name is Scott Reich and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for watching. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't, like if you do, hit that little bell so you get notifications. And remember, leave me a comment below. And remember, you can always listen to us anytime on any of your favorite podcasting apps. All right. Before we open the docket, support those that support Crime Talk. Please go to crimetalksearch.com, get yourself a background subscription service. When you sign up for that background subscription service, you can do as many background searches as you want. And the beautiful thing is you can cancel at any time. But when you type in the name of the person that you want to search, a report is literally generated while you wait, and that report is going to be emailed to you. It's going to have information about the person that you're interested in. Do they have a criminal history? Do they have to put themselves on one of those public registries? Are they married? Are they divorced? Do they own property? Do they have judgments against them? The types of things that, you know, sometimes when people are getting to know you, they're not going to tell you about. You need to check them out, okay? And we've talked about this before. If you're on a dating app, meeting people online, it is dating malpractice not to do a background search. A quick Google search simply is not enough. Go to crimetalksearch.com, get that background subscription service. You are going to be happy that you did. All right, let's go ahead and open the record for November 30th, 2022. Now, unfortunately, it has been more than two weeks since Kaylee Gunkovic, Zena Kernodal, Madison Mogan, and Ethan Chapin were stabbed to death in the middle of the night, and the suspect or suspects are still at large. Now, several theories have been floated about what may have led to the crime. Nothing seems to be panning out anything concrete anyway, thus far. Now, obviously the public has grown a little uh, frustrated with the length of answers. And now the prosecutor uh, in charge of the quadruple murder says, you know, there's been some misunderstandings. And when the police said the crime was targeted, apparently they meant the house itself was in somebody's crosshairs, not necessarily individuals themselves. So Bill Thompson, he's the prosecutor overseeing the investigation. He stated that the word targeted uh, was used to characterize was probably wrong, uh, conceding that it could have been interpreted to suggest one or more of the four victims were in the killer's crosshairs. But Mr. Thompson now says uh, that may not necessarily be the case. Instead, he said uh, this home was actually what the murderer was laser focused on. Uh, but he never really explained what he meant or why the police may think that. Mr. Thompson does say that they're still looking into whether any of the victims may have been targeted, but for now, it doesn't sound like they've uncovered anything that actually connects all the dots. He also says nothing strange like symbols and markings were left behind at the crime scene. He goes on to say, however, that he is not aware whether the doors to their rooms were in fact locked and also can't say for sure whether they were all sleeping at the time of the killings. Mr. Thompson also says that law enforcement has no reason to believe that this was drug related in any way. And all five of the cars parked at the house at the time of the uh, homicides have now been towed. Cops say they are storing them somewhere for long-term um, evidence gathering in case they need something in the future. Obviously, um, search warrants will be obtained and uh, they will be searched if they have not been searched already. Now, there's been talk that this house uh, was kind of a party house. Could it have been something where people didn't like, uh, you know, college kids partying at college? Could you imagine such a thing? Oh my goodness. Well, apparently a lot of people are suspicious of a guy who lives close to the uh, residence, but he's speaking out saying, I didn't do anything wrong. So this guy that lives close to the uh, four uh, murder university students has angrily denied 
and uh, lashed out at internet sleuths claiming that he should uh, be considered a suspect. This guy's a third year law student and his name is Jeremy Reagan. And he insists, although he's somewhat socially awkward, he has no link to this case whatsoever. He has given a series of interviews in the wake of the November 13 slains that have caught armchair detectives eye and had triggered some online smears of this guy. Now, Mr. Reagan also says he's been so spooked by the backlash that he's taken to carrying a gun to protect himself from any would-be vigilantes. He made a statement the other day on court TV, I didn't do it, I've had nothing to do with it, I have nothing to hide. He apparently says that he's willing to give DNA, fingerprints, whatever the police need. He's also revealed that officers have already questioned him about the quadruple homicide and didn't uh, bring anything during that interview to collect his DNA. They said, if we need you, uh, we'll come have you come down to the station. That's what he said. Now, authorities now believe that the uh, killer is some sort of uh, proud and very possessive of the uh, knife that they used in committing these uh, heinous murders. But nothing uh, goes back to this Mr. Reagan. And it's weird because Mr. Reagan said in a series of interviews that he believes his lack of composure has led to speculation uh, that he is guilty. He, like I said, he's, he's, he's apparently un... He's apparently awkward, uh, has some weird mannerisms, and um, the way he talks, uh, he just comes across as awkward. And also people said, oh, he has a bandage on his finger. How did that get there? So apparently he says that he might smile at points that he shouldn't, uh, might make weird hand movements uh, when he uh, shouldn't as well. Uh, plus, he thinks now the uh, amount of interviews that he's done uh, because he's this neighbor that somehow he is uh, probably should not have done that. He says that people have been ruthlessly analyzing those interviews, even though he's insisted that he was in bed when the murders took place and didn't know anyone in the house. The only thing he knew about the victims he previously told was that uh, their off-campus home in Moscow, Idaho was a party house. There were parties apparently there um, that were loud, he stated, and uh, he would take his dog out to go to the bathroom and he would just go walking by. He would look up and he would see people uh, in the window almost every night, probably four or five nights a week. Like I said, not unusual in a college town and a college house with college students. Still, apparently people online have described Reagan as strange and have compared his mannerisms to uh, Stephen McDaniels, who was found guilty of the 2011 murder of Lauren Giddens and serial killer Ted Bundy. Why is Jeremy Reagan wearing a black bandage on his left hand? Uh, somebody wrote on Twitter. I'm not accusing him, but that just seems strange. Or maybe he cut himself slicing a tomato. I don't know. You can't go around, ladies and gentlemen, accusing people of crimes that you have no basis to say they did anything about. This guy's a third year law student. He may figure out how to come sue you all. You need to use some common sense. You know, I've had this conversation a lot lately. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what you think. It only matters what you can prove in a court of law. And when you go around saying things that aren't true and you don't have any information to back it up, guess what? You are, you, you can be found guilty of defamation. Think about that, ladies and gentlemen, think, think. Apparently this guy also doesn't blink when he says, no, I went to bed, very strange. Um, people have even accused him of being the killer, going as far as to compare him to Ted Bundy. He knows too much about the girls and the layout of the house. And who really, he has also learned how to be a lawyer. Who does that sound like? Ted Bundy going around killing people? Are you kidding me, people? You can't, you can't do that. You can't do that. Well, anyway, a couple of those writers went on to say that Reagan would not have any preference of who he kills, but he knows he wanted to kill, and he knew Kaylee Goncalves had a dog. Are you serious, people? Get out of the um, armchair uh, sleuth business for sure. Another person actually said Jesse also suggested he might be guilty of homicides, writing that many perps in the past have inserted themselves into an investigation or did a bunch of media interviews about the killing. And this guy is doing just that. Are you kidding me? Now, Mr. Reagan has tried to explain his behavior, apparently writing in on a Reddit thread, you need to stop blaming me for something I had nothing to do with. Yes, I'm an incredibly awkward person, but that does not mean I have killed or attempted to kill 
anybody. I agree. If somebody's got some information on Mr. Reagan, take it to the police. But until and then, you shouldn't go around slandering people uh, by stating that they are quadruple killers. You can't do that. Now, Mr. Reagan also said he didn't seek out any of these interviews and uh, never claimed to have any beneficial information. He says, I was approached every time to do an interview and told the reporter beforehand that he didn't know anything. Uh, they still wanted the interview due to the uh, proximity of his house, so he said, sure. He went on to write that he was not actually wearing a bandage in the second interview, but rather put his thumb through the thumb hole in his shirt and said, there's nothing creepy or weird about noticing my surroundings, and I'm walking back to my apartment. Reagan also slammed the internet sleuth as wannabe internet detectives in the Reddit post and has revealed that he now carries the gun to, because people need to stop harassing him. I agree. I agree. You can't do that, people. Come on. That's, that's the problem with the internet. Everybody can say something and they don't have to back it up. And then when somebody says, hey, you can't say that, then you say, you're hurting my feelings. And then they want to cancel the person. I know your parents taught you better than that. Come on. All right. Next on the docket, the Delphi probable cause affidavit has been released. One word to describe it, weak. Now, I urge you to go watch our live show last night. We'll put a little link here. It was an hour. We read through it line by line, paragraph by paragraph, and outlined some of the issues with the case. It's weak. It may be enough to get somebody arrested, but that if that's all they got, that is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt, ladies and gentlemen. So please... Mr. Prosecutor in the Delphi case, please tell me you have some more evidence. All right, we'll give you the quick summary now. But more than five years after the slaying of the two Indiana teens in the small town of Delphi, details were released Tuesday in the case against the man accused in their killing. Now, while the documents shed some light onto uh, what happened that day, a lot of questions remain. Now, for those who aren't familiar, Abigail Williams, she was 13 and Libby German, 14 at the time, never returned to a prearranged pickup spot after their walk on the Delphi Historic Trails on the afternoon of February 13th of 2017. Searchers found their bodies the next morning, Valentine's Day, in a wooded area not far from the Monin High Bridge, which they had visited the day before. Now, in October, police announced that Richard Allen, of Delphi was arrested and charged with two counts of murder in the deaths of Libby and Abby. A redacted version of the probable cause affidavit was released. And when I mean redacted, the only thing that this judge, who I think is very good so far, only thing she redacted was the names of the witnesses. Everything else comes in, is released to the public. Kudos to the judge. And you have to remember, it was the defense that wanted this released and the prosecutor said, no, don't release it because they said that there could be one other person or others that acted with Mr. Allen, allegedly. Well, they sure didn't put that in their affidavit. So here is a brief summary of what you may want to know. So an unspent bullet found within two feet of one of the girl's bodies had been allegedly cycled through the firearm owned by Mr. Allen, according to investigators, and the firearm was located by investigators at Mr. Allen's home on October 13th during the search. Now, when we went through this last night, the, the caveat, the warning that comes with saying this firearm cycled through that bullet, which was a Sig Sauer P226, which is a mass-produced firearm, Frankly, um, police officers love Sig Sauer's and they're mass produced. And so the warning from the lab is that um, it's, uh, this analysis is subject to interpretation and it's subjective, which means it's open to interpretation, okay? It's not 100% ironclad that that firearm was the same one that was cycling through this unspent Fire, the unspent uh, round that was found next to the girls. So Mr. Allen didn't never denied that uh, he purchased the firearm in 2001, and he actually went to the Indiana State Police uh, Department voluntarily on October 26. When he spoke with the investigators, he stated he never allowed anyone to borrow or use the gun. When asked about the unspent bullet, 
He didn't have any explanation of why the bullet would be found between the bodies. Um, he again admitted that he was on the trail, but denied knowing victim one or two and denied any involvement in the murders. Now, Williams and German were killed uh, is still a mystery uh, to the public. The affidavit does not give a cause of death or explain how the girls were killed. However, you can kind of read between the lines where it was probably a sharp object. The affidavit also confirms the two girls were killed on the north bank of the Deer Creek as reported since February 14th of 2017. Now, a video taken by Libby German on the day the girls were killed was published and distributed by investigators. It shows a man in a dark jacket and jeans walking behind them on the Monon High Bridge on the trails east of Delphi. As the man in the video approached the girls, one of the team said, gun, according to the affidavit. Now, police first released a grainy image of the suspect from a video a day after the girls were found in 2017. A week later, they released audio of the man's voice saying, down the hill. The longer version of the same smartphone video released in 2019 shows the gait of the man as he was walking on the bridge, as well as a longer version of audio where he can be heard saying, guys, down the hill. Now, witnesses, according to the affidavit, told police they passed by a man on the trail that day Abby and Libby were killed and remembered seeing a car parked parking lot nearby. According to the affidavit, one of the three witnesses described the car as a PT Cruiser, another one said an SUV, and a third described it as a smart car. So here's a picture of a smart car. Here's a picture of a PT Cruiser. Here's a picture of a uh, SUV. And uh, here's a picture of a 2016 Ford Focus that Mr. Allen had at that particular time. You tell me, close? Hmm. Investigators believe those descriptions are similar enough in nature to the 2016 Ford Focus. So close enough. And one of the witnesses describes passing a man along the trail who wore a blue collar jacket and jeans and was muddy and bloody. She further stated that it appears he had uh, been in a fight, according to the affidavit. Now, only one of the witnesses described muddy and bloody clothing, and one witness said the man was wearing blue jeans and a blue jacket. As they passed by the man on the trail, uh, of the group said one of the members of the group said hi. The man glared at them. Uh, one of the witnesses said, according to the, uh, to the affidavit. Now, investigators believe that after the victims were murdered, Richard Allen returned to his vehicle by walking down the Carroll County Road 300 North, which is where he then got into his alleged vehicle and drove away. Like I said, we'll have to wait and see. I really do not know. I was really expecting all the stuff with... Keegan Klein, you know, he gave that big affidavit where the police were convinced that he was involved in some way. And then there's nothing. Go ahead, watch the video from last night. And um, I will also, if you Patreon member, you can watch the video last night where we use a Sig Sauer firearm and we show how to cycle through. Um, and uh, we explain the uh, problems with uh, gun uh science, so to speak. There's lots of problems with it. I'm sure the defense will have no problem finding an expert saying when you have a firearm this mass produced that there's no way to say this is an exact match in any way whatsoever, other than it came from, like I said, a mass produced firearm, oftentimes carried by police. Just saying. Sig Sauer has a general policy where they make give steep discounts or free firearms to uh, police officers. So it could have been a police officer for all we know. You just never know. But we don't like to make those things. I'm just, just saying. Next on the docket, is Alec Murdoch going to get a plea offer? Well, there is some speculation. Now, there's some speculation that the district attorney has broached the subject with Mr. Murdoch's attorneys for a 30-year plea offer to resolve all of his cases. Now, according to these um, sources that are coming forward about this, uh, they allege that the uh, prosecutor, Creighton Waters, made the 30-year plea offer during a face-to-face -face meeting with Mr. Murdoch's attorneys just prior to Thanksgiving, and the offer was also discussed on a phone conference with Murdoch's attorneys. Now, it's not clear whether the rumored agreement was reduced to writing, although some say there may have been some email correspondence regarding the 30-year offer. 
as you may recall, Mr. Murdoch is charged with the death of his wife and son and oh, like 79, 80 counts of theft from his law firm and clients. Now, the attorney general's office is saying there's always pretrial conversations between prosecutors and defense attorneys. That's true. Uh, but um, when those kind of conversations take place, they're, they're not anything official. I've seen plea officers say, hey, if your client's serious, you know, let me know. If he came back with this number to us, we would be interested. I could sell that to the victim's family. Um, I've had conversations where they're like, hey, there is no offer. This is a Gort case, guilty or trial. I've had others where we've gone groveling uh, to the uh, prosecutors begging for an offer and they say no. Um, other times it just kind of happens in court. Hey man, this, this case is overcharged. Why are you doing this? Uh, your offer sucks. Why don't we be more reasonable? And you usually kind of hash it out that way. But apparently no deal has been authorized according to the state, but 30 years. You know, that's not a bad deal if you're guilty with two homicides. You're going to look at spending the rest of your life in prison, plus all those other theft cases, plus the feds. But when you're 50-something years old and you're going to serve 30 years, chances are you're going to die in prison. You know what? That's one of those you shake, you roll the dice, baby. You go to trial. All right, Ghislaine Maxwell. Is she being manipulated by her husband, ex-husband? That's right. Ghislaine Maxwell and her legal team have been planning to appeal her conviction after she was found guilty on uh, five out of the six sex trafficking uh, charges, which include conspiracy to transport minors with intent to engage in criminal activity, transportation of minor with intent to engage in criminal activity, sex trafficking conspiracy to sex traffic a minor. Well, now her estranged ex-husband, Scott Borgensen, who cut ties with her while she was in custody, is refusing to pay the roughly $1 million in legal fees to cover the time needed for the appeals. You may also recall the story that we brought you where her attorneys, who are Denver-based, over there at old Haddon Morgan Foreman, very, very good law firm, they wanted to get paid. They got stiffed. They had to sue. We're talking, you know, like a million bucks. These kind of cases are expensive. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't get to decide if you don't get the result you want that you don't have to pay. It doesn't work that way. Anyway, the paperwork for the appeal is required to be sent by the end of January, but her lawyers aren't going to enter and uh, start the process until they get the retainer. Of course, he's already stiffed one law firm, then you make sure you don't do anything until you get paid. And apparently that's become a problem as Mr. Borgensen is currently almost entirely in charge of Elaine Maxwell's wealth. Now, someone close to the situation says that Borgensen has initially agreed to transfer the funds, but he is now being difficult about the request. Her lawyers have not been paid, the insider uh, uh, source uh, noted, and um, that is a serious matter. Worse, she needs to come up with the other $1 million to fund the appeal. Um, right now, Mr. Borgensen, the ex-spouse, uh, has given her nothing. Several of Maxwell's acquaintances also noted that they believe Mr. Borgensen may be purposely stalling the divorce proceedings in order to retain access to her cash. Apparently, Mr. Borgensen thinks if he uh, drags it out, she'll give him most of the money because um, obviously she's in jail. It's not like she needs it right now. However, other people have said that he hasn't paid the hefty bill because he doesn't trust what Maxwell lawyers are telling him. I'm sure this is what their attorneys are telling him. There are no promises or guarantees that we can make other than we will do our best for you. And um, justice is expensive. Injustice costs a hell of a lot more. So pony up the million bucks or get yourself a new attorney. Otherwise, we're gonna have the public defender handle Miss Maxwell's appeal. There you go. That's what the conversation is. Needless to say, Maxwell and Bergenson have been uh, uh, linked romantically apparently when they met in Iceland in uh, 2013 and then they tied the knot several years later uh, but their private rom romance uh, came as a surprise to many uh, friends and family members in fact her brother didn't even know uh, that she had been married uh, but she had made all of her but she had turned over all of her money to her now husband who won't give it up to anybody can you imagine being manipulated in such a way Ghislaine I mean seriously to be a pawn in such a, a scam and be at the uh, beholden to other people. <laughs> Could you imagine what she's going through, what she feels like right now? I just cannot believe it. Next, 
The city council in San Francisco says, bring on the robots. That's right. Police in San Francisco can now use lethal remote controlled robots to incapacitate suspects in emergency situations. Now, robots have previously been used to carry, you know, explosives uh, to blow up. And, uh, you know, oftentimes they have cameras on them to get a, a better assessment of the situation when there is a, a dangerous situation to the police. Well, this decision comes after Mayor London Breed's U-turn almost a year ago when she backtracked on her defund the police strategy in favor of a little more aggressive policing to replace what she called BS progressive policies. She had previously sliced $120 million from the budget of the police department in light of the Black Lives Matter protests in 2020 in favor of diverting money to local initiatives and other charities. Well, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors approved the decision in the meeting uh, Tuesday night, uh, voting eight to three in favor of allowing police to deploy the potentially deadly machines. Uh, discussion around the decision has been uh, somewhat emotionally charged, with critics saying that the authorities would just uh, lead to further militarization of the police force, already too aggressive with poor and minority communities. Supervisor Connie Chan, a member of the committee that uh, forwarded the proposal to the board allowing police to use the robot said she understood concerns over the use of force, but that California state law requires them to approve the use of military grade equipment. It's definitely not an easy discussion, she said, but the San Francisco Police Department stressed that it does not have pre-armed robots and has no plans to arm robots with guns, but they could deploy the robots equipped with explosive charges to contact, incapacitate, or disorient violent, armed, or dangerous suspects when lives are at stake. The San Francisco Police Department spokesperson said in a statement, robots equipped in this manner would only be used in extreme circumstances to save or prevent further loss of innocent lives. If it would save just one life, wouldn't it be worth it? How does Scott feel about that? Yeah, no. Anyway, supervisor later amended the proposal to specify that police officers could use robots after exhausting all other alternative uh, force or de-escalation tactics or have concluded that they would not be able to subdue the suspect through those alternative means. Only a limited number of high-ranking uh, San Francisco officers could authorize the use of the robots um, as a deadly force option. Uh, apparently, the San Francisco Police Department has 17 robots, 12 of which are fully functional, but have never been used to attack an individual or to deliver explosive devices. Well, they've never been approved to incapacitate somebody, but now they are. Apparently, these robots are all remote controlled and are typically used to investigate and defuse bombs or survey areas in dangerous situations where officers have difficulty accessing the area. But with... Uh, the major crime in San Francisco being up by 5.4% so far this year from 2021, assaults up 8.7% and robberies up 6.4%. I'm guessing, I'm guessing we're going to see the robots in use pretty darn quick. And finally today, our dumb criminal of the day. Please meet Jose Jr. Vigil. Now, according to the deputies, Jose Jr. Vigil was charged with fleeing and eluding resisting arrest, possession of marijuana, and possession of drug paraphernalia. Police allege that Mr. Vigil crossed United States Highway 1 on Stock Island at approximately 2.47 a.m. on a scooter with no lights. Clearly, this is a gateway crime. You start having people riding scooters at night with no lights. Next thing you know, they're going to be robbing banks. It's going to be mayhem. Cats and dogs will be friends. You have to stop it now. Anyway, the deputies attempted to stop the man as he traveled uh, south toward Key West on the sidewalk. Mr. V. Hill refused to stop for deputies and continued to drive to a hotel near the entrance of Key West, where he then fled on foot. The police, undeterred because this kind of crime has to be stopped, attempted to follow uh, Mr. V. Hill and attempted to shock him with tasers. But once again, the police were unsuccessful. Mr. Vigil then jumped into the water and refused to come out. Deputies say that uh, responding Key West police officers ultimately convinced Mr. Vigil to get out of the water, probably convincing him it's not that big of a deal. And what happened? Well, they found a small amount of marijuana and multiple plastic baggies found in Mr. Vigil's possession. He was booked into the Monroe County Jail on a no bond hold, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Mr. V Hill, it was probably no big deal. They probably would have made you walk. 
and that would have been the end of it. But you left. But yes, Mr. V. Hill, you are our dumb criminal of the day. Congratulations. You made it. All right. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk.